it's, I think, exceedingly fitting that as we move into the home stretch uh, of our program, uh, that rather than looking backwards, we look forward. Uh, the basic notion as we look at the group of senior executives that is gathered here today is that most of us will hopefully be at the very pinnacle of our responsibility and authority at roughly the turn of the century. And since we very much believe that education is not a process that ends with graduation, uh, but one that really should and must continue through one's career, the question that we're really going to be addressing today and for the next several days is where is the world going uh, between now and, say, the year 2000? Uh, where is management going between now and the year 2000? And what do we as managers need to do uh, to make ourselves as effective as possible in what's bound to be a changing context? I think it might be useful uh, to think of a, of a simple model, perhaps, of, of where we are. Um, if we argue that right now we're here, uh, this is the year 2000, and out here there's some sort of an environment. And if we can understand what that environment looks like, uh, what the world's going to be like, uh, we can begin to deal with the question of what is it going to take uh, to be as effective as we could be uh, out, in that, out in that environment. Uh, our plan for this process, as you know, extends over several days. Uh, step one, which is really this morning, is to look at that world out there. You know, to really ask, where is it that we're going? What is that world going to look like? And then based on that picture, uh, for us, uh, using what we've learned in these eight weeks, uh, plus what we've learned in our entire careers, uh, to really focus on the question of what are managers going to have to do uh, to make that work. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, this morning to have with us uh, two of the most distinguished people possible uh, to help us uh, with that task, our Dean Lester Thoreau uh, and the uh, extraordinarily renowned uh, physicist uh, Philip Morrison. Uh, Philip is going to be the first to speak. Uh, I know you've all had a chance to look at his biography, as have I, so I'm not going to go back over it. Uh, it's obviously a very distinguished one. I guess there's really one thing I'd like to emphasize, however, and one thing I'd like to, to add to it. Uh, as I went through the biography, which is obviously replete with important publications, major appearances, and extraordinary awards and honorary degrees, I think the thing that struck me most is the fact that uh, Philip is an institute professor at MIT. And I think it's important to know that within MIT there's really no honor uh, that is greater than that. Uh, the other thing about Philip Morrison is I think despite, in addition to being uh, an important scholar, he's a, a very, very effective communicator. And as a symbol of this, and Philip doesn't know I'm going to do this, but uh, Philip, in fact, has made a very major contribution to marketing. Uh, there's a company out there that manufactures this particular device. I'm not sure you can all be able to see it, but it really has some pretty remarkable <laughs> uh, characteristics. And uh, I think one more, maybe. <laughs> For reasons that Philip will explain to you, not I, uh, this has been, in fact, uh, a very major part of his recent work. Philip? <laughs> By the way, where is that made? <laughs> Hong Kong, I suspect. <laughs> I understand that May Day is deferred till tomorrow. Perhaps the red hats will not reappear. In <laughs> My task is uh, uh, really an onerous one. I have always to begin by quoting the hero of all physicists, Niels Bohr, who was a man who had was no, no hand at the epigram, but everything he said was so full of meaning that it, most prosaic statements become epigrams. He said, prediction is very difficult, especially of the future. <laughs> and it's in that vein that I'm supposed to talk for a while. And I thought I w what I'm about to do is just 
give some feeling for what I, why I, what I think and really why I think it concerning the technical and scientific, particularly the scientific, a lesser degree, the technological environment that will surround uh, the industrial world in the next uh, decade or so. That's not the most impossible thing to do because I've, with many other bold prophets, talked about a century in the future, and that's very safe. You'll never be contradicted, uh, con confronted with the, with the uh, test of that, so it's all right. But uh, even, even 10 or 15 years is very difficult. I will mention one or two times uh, earlier forecasts of the same kind, so it will be discussed. But I thought that just to come baldly out and do this uh, affair of uh, enumerating a number of changes which most of you will think are plausible, I thought it would be fairer to try to put the whole thing in the context, the context of how it is that this is done. Of course, it is done, whatever one does, it is done essentially by continuity, allowing for the existence of discontinuity as well, which one has to jump through conceivable, but are not that easy to predict. But we know nowadays nonlinear systems, which history is the most extraordinary one, uh, allows itself all sorts of creative leaps as well as steady continuous evolution. Nothing is clearer in the lessons of physics or biology than that. Now being mathematicized to great public acclaim, but in fact not so new as it's cracked up to be. So what I want to talk about a little bit is what is the basis for what I think is, is coming and of course, the accident of whether it comes the next 10 or 15 years or not is a little harder to be sure, but what I think I can say very reliably is what kind of stance, what kind of machine is running here, and then what it, how its wheels turn is something a little bit harder to guess. We don't know the, the, the full design of this device. What I'm prepared to say is, uh, and to defend rather, rather firmly, is that we have come more or less to an end worthwhile looking at it, of a century of extremely powerful, unprecedentedly powerful natural science, particularly those sciences that are around and derived from physics. Modern physics began, physics is never very good at dates, and so it can be said to have begun in 1896, not the 20th century. 20th century physics began in 1896, four years early. And that's at the discovery of the X-ray, Rentgen's famous discovery of the X-ray, which is a prodigious discovery, not so much for its content, which in a way could have been and should have been predicted, but for its impact. It turned out that within a month of Rentgen's original publication, absolutely unexpected result, it had been duplicated, multipl multiplicated, replicated all over the world in Colorado College, Colorado Springs, Colorado, in Dartmouth, in Japan, in Siberia, you name it. Wherever there was some kind of enterprising department of physics in a college, those people had the equipment which would demonstrate what Rentkin found that wonderful evening in his lab when he was preparing uh, to look into these things. And that's remarkable. It was latent everywhere. And a latent discovery is one of the hardest kinds to predict because you say, if something really new is going to be found out of all this stuff, why hasn't it happened yet? And of course the answer is it will happen soon, but you never know that and running the movie backwards is much easier. Exactly the same thing happened a second time with even more fateful consequences, not for physics but for the world as a whole. In 19, December 1938, Hahn and Strassmann published the remarkable fact that when you bombarded uranium with neutrons, you produced barium. And they, among the most skilled of radio chemists in the world, certified that it was barium it produced, and not the neighboring element, a transuranic or something like radium, which simulates barium quite a lot, but is not the same thing. That very discrimination had escaped Fermi five years earlier. The result that they published in an obscure way which is not the way a physicist would do it, was picked up by Frisch and Meitner two weeks, three weeks later. And in January 1939, the world on the brink of war, that discovery too, discovery of fission, was repeated all over the world. The apparatus was present, the materials were present, the ideas were present. All you had to do was have this. You had failed to notice it, those. You had failed to notice this latent result. And those, of course, are the hardest things to predict. And they are naturally becoming less relatively less frequent, less important, 
because people are they're more conscious people trying hard to do those things with everything that they have. But that does not mean they will not happen. They will happen. But they're probably, therefore, that's the sort of thing we cannot really disclose. What is latent in what we're doing today that we don't know in the whole domain of science? But mention that. But I want to talk about now the more continuity, the, the side of continuity. And I think I can fairly say that I'm going to have three or four points of this general kind. I'll try to do it rather quickly. The first is we have had 100 years, maybe 110, to people like Boltzmann and Gibbs and the later Maxwell who understood for the first clear time in physics, though it was well known in gambling and actuarial insurance and so on, that probability, like causality, played an essential role in the prediction and understanding of complicated and interesting physical systems. I don't want to oppose them. I think that the philosophers by now are almost talked out of the view that between causality and <coughs> chance there is a great gulf and that passing from one to the other is a complete change in the view of the world. I don't think that's true. I think they interpenetrate. We can't understand the world without both of them. And this realization was what came to the physicists slowly, slowly from 1880 maybe until 1900 or so and then sealed in blood by quantum mechanics in 1925. And I think we'll never go back on it. The present concern, which has the rubric chaos, is only a replay of this same game in a little unexpected quarter where indeed Poincaré had pointed to it 50 years, 75 years ago, but it was too hard to do without computers. With computers you can explore the whole thing. So I claim that for, well, yes, am I right? Let me illuminate the analytical changes that occur. First, that we understand that probability and causality are related. They're causal chains, and they have probabilistic interference and consequences as well. There are atoms, and atoms make up all the matter of the world. Indeed, if I extend the idea of atom a little bit, also radiation. We call them quanta or photons, but it's atoms of radiation from the point of view of general thinking. And the most striking development, which only goes back to the eve of the Second World War, acquired its strength only after the Second World War, is that language description, all the superstructure of knowledge, is also to be analyzed in the atomic sense and turned into a category which I may call broadly information. And the understanding of information and noise and signal and all those things with the, you see that the metaphors come already from electrical engineering, which is where it arose. But now, of course, it dominates understanding in, in biology. The whole world of the computer is based on it. The entire feedback system we inherit from the eve of World War II has come from electrical engineering to be a very wide concept throughout all of thoughts. And I think that's the third analytic change that we have to have. And on the basis of this analytic change, I feel that we have moved through testing and uh, elaborating these methods very far until now we are prepared, not quite ready, but prepared for the systematic synthesis of all this analytic understanding in a variety of ways, and I will, I will talk about them quickly. First of all, I think, based on this, we have now and will gain steadily, but only incrementally, a control of material. Control of the material world is very great. The best examples of which are now shown by the, the powerful actions of polymer chemistry, manufacturing, manufacturing substances more or less to design, rather limited range of substances, but still very, very important ones. But the other side of my coin is the recent extraordinary discovery of the high temperature superconductor, which I suspect will be for a long time the last really chancy discovery of a fundamental physical uh, change in materials, which we really did not anticipate. I think within the last few weeks, we've been given very good arguments to show that we do even understand the high temperature super. We have a, a working theory of it. And the working theory suggests very strongly that we will go to room temperature and beyond, and that superconductivity will really be a much more common phenomenon. I hasten to say, and I hope I'm right, I don't know that I'm right in this, but I do not believe that it will lead to a revolutionary change in, in engineering practice, as many prints now tell you. I think this is self-serving and to some degree naive. I think it will be important, but it will be important incrementally. It is a powerful discovery for the power systems, for 
electric motor design, for computer and instrumentation, uh, miniaturization and uh, reliability. But if you look every, everywhere, it deals, so to speak, with losses and frictions. And losses and frictions are well known in engineering and technology. They're always present. Getting rid of them makes a difference. Yes, it's economic and desirable, but of course it won't take care of all of it. And you're talking about 20%. That's, I mean, otherwise you wouldn't do processes that are more lossy than 20% in general. And this is the general idea. So I don't believe that it's a revolutionary thing. That doesn't mean to say, well, here and there make a great change. It will. But broadly, it is not like introduction of electric power, which transformed the entire world. It's an improvement in electric power, which will not transform, though it will certainly modify and affect the world everywhere. However, I think that we can see that the quantum control of materials will spread widely. And step by step, we'll have more objects like this. We'll have superfluids on high high temperature scale, we'll have other quantum phenomena that happen in controlled materials, of which, of course, the earliest one is the transistor, in a way, and that will be extended. But again, this is not something that will uh, spread to everyday life. It'll be embodied in the technology of the future in 10 or 20 years, but in a way which will be recognizable as incremental improvement of what we have, just as chemical synthesis is. In connection with this also, the rational analysis of material has already led to the development of structure, one of the most important uh, sides of material science, by understanding the nature of failure, analysis of the nature of failure, giving rise to the behavior of composite materials. This, I think, is quite important now because it touches not so much the engineering world, which it will touch, technology, but it touches the environmental supply of raw materials because it is clear to me, I'm not saying, uh, be premature to say it is over. The age of iron is not over, but its end is in sight. Silicon, the glasses in general, diamond in the future, are going to be structural <coughs> materials. Composites, complexly designed, intricately built and designed to meet each purpose, are going gradually to replace the minerals which we supply, in spite of the strange concomitant truth is that the same analysis, which has a second element I'll come to, it comes to my second point, that physics and chemistry and electrical engineering related these fundamental sciences have given rise to a second change. Not only do we have an analysis, which gives rise to what we, I say, we now understand the world pretty well in these domains, but a second thing has happened which takes us to the edge of the problem of natural resources, and indeed to sciences far beyond resources. And that is what I would like to call the beginning, we don't have it yet, but a, we have a sophisticated view which will gradually lead to something like mastery, what I would like to call perception. Perception, not only human perception, but also the perception of the scientist and the technology. The instrumentation and the detection of what's going on out there, whether out there be another planet or a tested bar of, of glass that you're trying to see how, it, how cracks propagate in it. In every case, it's the instrumentation and the sophisticated way of ha collecting and handling data because we have mastered the way of doing interfaces with all sorts of physical parameters. We have a very powerful instrumentation world. It is on this basis that the field sciences Meteorology, geology, oceanography, astronomy, ecology, I suppose, to name a few, are now in phases of active understanding and exploitation, mainly because physics, which was not particularly valuable in understanding these matters, its analysis is somewhat remote, but physics and the concomitants of physics have given rise to instrumentation that enables you to measure everything very well, very quickly, in all kinds of domains of parameter space that you never investigated before. And as you know, you can buy these wonderful sensors for most things. This perceptual improvement in science was, I think, the prerequisite for the success of the field sciences. Up till now, it was all pioneering work. We still can't perceive very well the depths of the Earth. We can do the first few thousand feet pretty well. And I think we'll, this is a barrier to us. We're probably not easily cross. And of course, it's also rather remote from us because to gain it is very difficult. That diamonds come up from 100 miles down in the pipes 
is a remarkable and dramatic event. We haven't seen one yet. Some one will happen one day. They occur every million years or two. They scatter over the whole world. They're independent of geological time. There are huge cold volcanoes coming up. They make the diamonds of the world until we learned how to make diamonds. And now, of course, not the same problem. And as I said, I think it's fair to say that diamond and diamond-like materials will gradually take their rather interesting place in the commodity, in, in the commodity market, in the engineering materials which we make our world. It's going to happen quite soon. The beginning of it is now, so I can say it will happen in 10 years' time, some of it. Now, the most important of all the perceptual gains is the, oh, I, should, I meant to say that this, because we have a powerful geology, because we understand, for example, the teleconnections of meteorology, we begin to understand them. We know that the monsoon and its successor failure, which waters the entire South Asian subcontinent and is the staff of life for billion persons at least, is intimately connected to events on the coast of Peru and Chile. There's no question about this any longer. The correlation was dimly seen 50 years ago by perceptive meteorologists and is now beginning to be in the domain of analysis. And pretty soon we'll be able to make forecasts of those things. I think it's very likely we can. And that's the beginning of teleconnections. And I strongly suspect that we'll gradually have a more mature climatology than the present one, which is confronted with nothing but skepticism and uncertainty. That's got to improve. We don't know how to do that yet. But I think that's one of the big things that we'll have on the basis of this. Now, of course, one is an optimist. Maybe it'll take more than 10 years, but it's coming. The other important side, of course, what comes with it is the ability to predict the occurrence of minerals already being happened, already happening. However, it happens at a time when the minerals that you would so wonderfully predict, like diamonds and copper, are going to be of less and less economic value, in my view. And so while you will be able to predict the presence of copper mines and find that South Africa is not the only place endowed with huge numbers of uh, diamond pipes, you won't care so much because anyhow, the glass, the fiberglass cables, and the synthesized diamond layers will probably be more useful than the natural commodity, though they won't drive it off uh, out of existence as nothing ever goes away. So that's a curious uh, anomaly but is there. Now, I tried to say, and I come to it, that the most important perceptual consequence, I think, of a contemporary understanding of atoms, which is based on chemistry and physics, and of the, what I said, probability, causality, atoms, and information, taking these together and applying them since the double helix to the substances and processes of living forms has made a huge development in scientific thought and in everyday life, which will grow the biology of information. Primarily based on microbiology, which I hasten to say, and has given an enormous change, I think, in, in view of the world, which I want to put forward to it. I think you probably recognize, but probably underestimate, as I did, underestimate. And that is, what we recognize now, I think it's quite clear, is that the wonders of life really cut in two. There is the development from a cell to a multicellular organism, which we ourselves are, which is responsible for the entire complexity we associate with life, as we think of it. The museums show us the earliest fossils, and between the earliest fossils and the, the rainforest of today and the, the uh, ecologist tramping across it, uh, there's a big judgment, a big gain, a big improvement in complexity. We talk about that all the time, and the museums are full of it, which you call evolution. But that's only the last 15%. 85% was buried in biochemistry. But all the biochemical tricks are held by the microbiology. The cells do everything except this wonderful trick of finding out how to cooperate and make multicellular creatures, which is still beyond us. We will not solve the problem of development in the next 10 or 20 years. But we will really, and we have made, great progress in the biochemistry of life and some reconnaissance into how that biochemistry affects the developed organism, which gives rise to the success and uh, failure of uh, of medical pharmacology and so on, where we have all kinds of drugs and all kinds of effects and all kinds of substances, good and bad, and all sorts of new information carrying and uh, metabolic systems, subsystems, which constantly fill the news and win the Nobel Prizes, but still come primarily as surprises 
out of another, out of the domain of, you find some substance, you can isolate that does something else in another test cell, and that's the way it goes. There is no, we don't yet have a, a true picture of development in all its stages. I think it's very important because it makes clear to us that the evolutionary process is not related to size necessarily, is not related to this thing that uh, the history of Earth, the history of life begins about three and a half or four billion years ago with very modest organisms indeed, which transcended the geological world by introducing the, the chemical modifications made in life and the self-reproducing system in ways not yet understood, which will uh, which still dominate, as I say, what we understand about the developing the human body or all higher forms, but will not always do so. But that, that break will not come in the next 10 or 20 years. That's the serious matter for the future. Of course, in practical events, the molecular model of, of uh, human behavior, does, of human physiology, does give rise to many novelties. Practical surgery gives rise to many novelties. We see much control being taken on all sides, but it is still as everyone recognizes, who just looks at what happens in the papers year after year, is very much a matter of chance and of exaggeration. We don't really have a systematic growth, as I think we have, say, in solid state physics or something like that. We don't have that yet. We're on the edge of it. And I mention particularly, because it is so much in everyone's mind, the return of infectious disease, of, epi of epidemiology, as a major public concern, which I think will continue, because we don't yet have the skills to beat back the ingenious genetic uh, apparatus of viruses, of which, of course, HIV is the one, the human immunovirus is the one that takes all the news today. But I recommend to you that you consider the still urgent fact that we do not know why 1% of all influenza virus cases in 1918-19 led to a fatal primary viral pneumonia that we cannot cure the primary viral, viral pneumonia, we cannot yet immunize against the effects of influenza new strains, we don't know where they come from, we are puzzled before this disease, which has been reasonably benign for 60 years, but uh, may not always be. And uh, we have the arsenal of, of uh, molecular biology to attack it, and a lot of information, but short of solutions. This, of course, goes uh, as well to the other important biological, the other, besides health, the most important biological concern of, of uh, science and of technology, and that is, of course, the crops. Someday, indeed, we will not do crops as we do today. Someday, indeed, we'll have a much better understanding of biological processes, which we gain our food. Someday, indeed, that will be an industrialized structure but that day is not here, and I do not think, I, I think you will even live to see it. Oh yes, occasionally here and there, but we're going to take energy from the sun in green leaves to make proteins and cellulose, as we've done for a long, and, and starches, as we've done for a very long, long time, for a long time to come, 100 years or 200 years, but I don't think it will always be true. We have not come to the end of the agricultural revolution which began not with uh, 1948 or 55, but began at 6,000 BC. That still has a, a little while to work. Influences, improvements, uh, yes indeed, but not the whole thing. The other perceptual change which I think I have to talk about is the gloomy subject, but very important in the world economically and in, in the thinking of every reasonable person, is the problem of warfare. And I have to say that two things, of course, the understanding of the atom, which gave rise to the inordinate outpouring of energy, which we associate with nuclear weapons, is now augmented by the development of perception, which I think has come in the, it's because it's most extreme and most, cost, uh, most costly, the battlefield is now become, has now become a place where perception is all and where self-guiding devices are gradually penetrating more and more so that what, that which can be seen can with high probability be destroyed. And this is going, I think, for the first time in a long while to favor the, the defense, that is to oppose the distant interdiction which is the 
projection of power, which is so characteristic of the great powers, especially the United States. It's getting harder. And if you don't uh, think it is, consider the situation in the Persian Gulf, consider the situation in Afghanistan, just to be even-handed, and you'll see what's happening to the great powers, limited both by the social perception of their citizens who don't want to fight so much, but also by the fact that the opposition, with a few tens of thousands of dollars, can do in some mighty million-dollar equipment that you're very proud of, that you've manufactured at great, to great success in, in Novosibirsk or in uh, El Segundo, and it's not going to last too long out there. And that's another story of perception, this generalized improvement of the sensory, which has made physics what it is today, and physics is given now to every other scientific activity, and now the technical ones. And the third element that I want to talk about, which is a novel quality of the new sciences, which is going to continue and enlarge, is more important probably for the truly important matter of science, our understanding of the world, our views and metaphors towards what we are, our place in, in, in the scheme of things, than it is for direct improvement of economic sort, but still quite important. And that is the understanding of the physicists, the astronomers, the geologists especially, natural science have grown, of the great importance of history. How contingent are the things we see around us rather than how fixed and immutable and just the way things are. The best example I can give, I think, to make a long story, which has many ramifications, a short one, is to consider the solar system. Because I grew up through this. As a, I can tell you, as a, as a thoughtful physicist, I believe, I grew up through this. And I found my views completely erroneous and completely transformed in the course of a single career. And I'm not the only one. When I was a graduate student, I studied almost risibly the careful dynamics of the 19th century heroes of dynamics who showed us elegant ways of making little calculations, not so exciting, in classical physics, Newtonian mechanics. And their real purpose was to essentially to improve the almanac, to make possible predictions of the motions of the planets in the solar system a hundred years in the future, accurate to 10 seconds, which more or less what we can do. The eclipse, you don't expect it, doesn't overwhelm you anymore. And of course, that was the, even the 19th century, that was the great metaphor for scientific causal prediction, the mechanical rise of science. You could predict the eclipse, you could predict the unseen planet Neptune could be found from Newton, and the Enlightenment seemed fully you know, fulfilled in this mechanistic way. It was a great triumph, I'm not denying that. And we studied very hard the Poisson brackets and the full paraphernalia that enabled that improvement. It depends in principle upon Newton's laws, nothing new about that, that's why it comes from the Enlightenment. But it, it much improved their practical applicability by developing mathematical techniques for handling many body systems of the kind of the solar system. That means, what is the solar system? Well, you all know what it is. It's an awfully regular thing. All the planets go the same way. If there's one exception among the 60 satellites, it's written down and everybody memorizes in school which it is. All the planets lie in a disk. Well, if one is tilted by five degrees, you're quite worried. And this is the way it goes. They all spin with one exception again, uh, more or less perpendicular to that disk. And everything is so regular. And it's this great architecture of the world, right? And so, as a student, I thought it was a very dull subject. I did not want to spend my time learning how to improve the ninth decimal place by really quite elaborate calculation, especially, I must admit, because in those days you do the calculation. <laughs> I did that for a whole summer. It was a really tedious activity with a millionaire uh, made in Zurich in 1912, a wonderful machine which multiplied the streetcar controller's handle. It really did, and I hand crank. I could have had a motor, but that was the, the my boss used the motorized millionaire. I, <laughs> it didn't make much difference. It's like clank, 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 clank. It just saved your arm, but it didn't improve your patience. Well, we learned that that's not intrinsic in the laws of gravity, the nature of Newtonian mechanics at all. That's a consequence of history. The planets have worn each other smooth. They've worn their orbits smooth. That's why we're all in a disk. That's why they all go the same way. Once upon a time, it was a highly chaotic mess. And what evolved was what is stationary. And all the rest was thrown away or 
lump together to make the planets. There's no doubt about that. Now, the signs of it are clear. We have a few exceptions, like the comets, which still don't share that. But I, that's not a talk on astronomy. It's a very interesting subject, because it's a metaphor for all our change in the philosophical point of view. We know now that what we see around us in the world is not only the result of the irrefutable laws of physics, but also the contingent result of boundary conditions. And we gradually understand, we can understand those boundary conditions as being connected to the conditions of, of the world. And so we gradually have a historical element in physics. It's especially strong in cosmology today. And the, the best discovery of, a, of a, at MIT, in physics anyhow, was that of inflation, the universe, which is essentially a way of saying that long, long ago, when matter was quite different from the way it is now, there was a thing called repulsive gravity. Gravity, you know, is attractive. But in those days, it was the other kind dominated. And it blew the world apart, the universe apart, and gave rise to the expansion <laughs> and the uniformities which we now see, and we begin to understand how this happened and why it was inevitable. And one of the great issues is to connect that with everyday particle physics. We haven't quite done that yet, and that will not happen in the next 10 years either, but it is on the agenda, and more and more interest will come from that. And the philosophical, lagging <coughs> philosophical view that we all have to have will arise out of that. And I think for me, though, it was quite clear that Newtonian mechanics, like the motion of the continents, like the bombardment of the Earth with asteroids, which was the pre- which was the sterilization act that fixed the time of the origin of life because you couldn't have life when nothing on the surface was not churned up every million years, churned up and flung into the air, if not vaporized. That's what was happening in early times on the Earth. And we see the signs on the moon which froze its geology. It's nothing but craters. The Earth was nothing but craters either. But that's a long time ago. And when that rain subsided, then the Earth began to have the cycles which we now think of as these inexorable cycles which give the routine, the establishment of the history of the Earth, but are contingent upon the presence of a solar system, which was long worn out and gave up flinging things at all parts. That's the sort of the story. So this is some view of what I think is, uh, has happened and is, is happening. And I should go a little bit further and try to make some statements about what I think is going to be the case in the next 10 or 15 years on the more economic side. Well. I am a reluctant incrementalist. Having read a good deal, especially this year, I tried very hard to, for some lectures I had to give at, at Cornell, I tried very hard to read the literature on agricultural economics and agriculture, the Green Revolution and the anti-Green Revolution and all these things. And I've come broadly to the conclusion that incremental change in agriculture will continue, probably increase. But we will not see any substantial worldwide change in this situation. People will remain hungry until they can grow better crops. They'll grow better crops the way they grow them now, only better, with more inputs, with more attention, with more, more genetics, with more plant breeding. But nothing different in principle from what the prudent farmer has been doing ever since the 17th century and the really excellent parts of the world, the garden spots, ever since 3000 BC. It's going to be the same thing. Of course, with the inputs of modern chemical industry, modern biotechnology, but uh, it won't look different. Health, too, has the same phenomenon. We have, of course, wonders, as I pointed out, the molecular biologist and the microsurgeon can do wonderful things. The development of all sorts of hormone and quasi-hormone-like systems makes possible the attack on all kinds of human uh, difficulties. But I think everybody knows that the refract that the end of medicine is the reduction of all human ailments to iatrogenic disease. That is, when medicine is perfectly powerful, it will still make mistakes. And the mistakes will be the cause of your troubles. So it's, uh, statistics will tell you there's nothing to be said about that. There's no question that that's the case, in my view, as an asymptotic affair. We're far from that now. But right now it is pretty clear to me that the marginal dollar in public health does a great deal better for the population than the marginal dollar in the best preventive surgery, but it has different purposes and different ends, and we don't like to change our lifestyles quickly, and so that's why we tolerate the way we get along with automobile accidents and smoking and so on, and traumas and drugs and everything else that uh, dominate the newspapers. It will be looked back upon as the sort of way we look back at the 19th century problems of public health where there was no sunshine and no light and no air and no clean clothes, which have done much more than, I believe, all the medicine and all the bacteriology in the world 
to make a difference in the vital statistics, which is probably where the, where the answer is to be read, uh, I think what you would call the bottom line. And I think that's, that's the situation. Well, we, we'll improve that too, but it's, it's a very complicated system, which I'm not prepared to un unravel. Now, in engineering and in engineering machinery, it's clear everyone can see what's happening. It's happening, it's going to happen even more. What we're going to have is, of course, embedded intelligence in machines. We're gradually transferring more and more subtle skills from craftsmanship, artisanship, judgment, to embodiment by analysis and then by synthesis of the device that can do it, by the perception of the device that feels its environment. Every machine, every operation is going to get better and better and incrementally improved. But I don't, I'm not witty enough to see any grand change in this that will say this is the revolution. It's not so. We saw with the, the programmable electronic calculator in 1945 we saw the wave of the future in the sense of the idea. And with the transistor, we saw something better could be done about it. But the real change, I think it was an amazing change, which goes well beyond the domain of physics and chemistry into what I would call the most elementary but wonderful kind of engineering, was simply a, a modification of packaging done by well, actually uh, foreseen by an English electronics expert called Dummer, man who invented the, uh, the radar position indicator during World War II. The same man came to Washington in the 1950s and said he foresees the time. This is the time when transistors, this is the time when the Bureau of Standards and the IBM company were busy making cordwood circuits by machines that stamped out, you know, and put resistors on the circuits. And you got cards pretty fast. 42 resistors and nine condensers and some things, and this little circuit was wonderful. You put it into a shell. You could put it along a shelf and have a computer that only filled up a room like this. And it was transistorized. It was quite nice. And it was made automatically, and it was system whatever it was, I think, 360. Thank you. And, uh, but it was a failure of imagination. And, of course, what happened was the noise and a few others discovered from Dummer's idea, I think, you could make a tran one transistor that would be subdivided, one little piece of silicon. And now, of course, this has gone to the point where it's now the equivalent of a million or eventually 10 million gates in that little thing. And we have the chips, and then the world of the future will not go back on that. They'll get better, they'll have quantum mechanical effects that will do very well, but it's the same thing. And there's a packaging change. It's not really any change in understanding. Now, to carry it out required profound understanding of a thousand subtle details having to do with etching and lithography and dopants and uh, ep uh, epitaxial deposition and a panoply. So again, it's the same kind of thing. Perception and analytic control of the solid state world, the atomic world, understanding statistics. And, and those are, that's the power of what we have today. And that power will not go away. It will spread. It will spread, of course, to all countries and all domains. But it is not a fast thing. Now, one th you all know, and I'm sure you deal with and I have to end this way, with what I would call information at the human level, dealing with people, telling them what, what they're doing, what's, what their inputs are, and so on. And here, of course, it, I can't say any more as much as you can about what you see and know. But I would want to make one remark, which is a very interesting, for me, a very interesting and important remark. And that is, the more we intervene between the observation and the human perception, the understanding, which we tend to do as we have digital processing and collection of information and all those wonderful things, the more we intervene, the more the evidential chain is made complex and the more, therefore, it is corrupted. I'm very concerned about this. We already see it at MIT. It's far gone. Our students, our engineering students, our physics students are farther from the d d data than they ever were. For them, data appears on a screen. Maybe they were clever and designed the interface that brought it there. But even so, and when our colleagues publish something, we're not so sure what they've said because the intermediation is so great, you haven't the time to go back and examine their software. A software error could corrupt an entire domain of physics today. And if that's true for the physicist, I suggest it's much worse for everyday life. Because what I hasten to remind you, I'm sure you know this, once upon a time, the philosophers, the popular philosopher of science, for example, Eddington and Jeans were very strong on this, if you can remember their names, very able people, there's no question about it, pointed directly 
at the fact that the physicist had reduced the world to a rather abstract structure based on pointer readings. And then putting together this collection of coincidences, what meters said, was a very strange way to describe the world. It's a remarkable effectiveness. I don't think it is that strange. It's much what happens inside the head, but we don't think about that. But in any case, it's, uh, whether they were right or wrong, uh, they were able to talk about pointer readings. And then what came as a great surprise to everyone is that, of course, pointer readings are obsolete. You have a hard time finding meters outside the amateurs' laboratories today because it's all being displayed in a complicated way on a screen, even as an image. An image is evidential. If I want to know if the smokestack is belching out smoke, I can read the meter, but maybe the meter is wrong. If I see the image in the TV set, the closed circuit TV that looks at the end of the smokestack, I know it's smoke. It can't, you can't have an error that makes the white smoke look black and different. You know, you don't expect that. The system is redundant. But alas, I can tell you now that you'll buy an interface pretty soon that you can connect the, the image of the white smoke and it comes out black smoke in the image. And this is happening, perhaps it's happening in a more subtle domain. We watch the presidential candidate, we see the result of a complex corporate structure of advisors and uh, makeup men and speechwriters, we know that. But alas, even the image will not be the man or woman one day soon. <laughs> You'll buy it from some frame store device that could smooth out the wrinkles and improve the speech, and, it, and this worries me a great deal. And therefore, I like to close by saying I think that against this world, which I've portrayed and some of the roots of it and some of the changes are going to happen, I think that in industrial society, we have to work especially hard to democratize the understanding of this structure because we are getting farther and farther from perception. We want to, I think, to make science and engineering not in detail. They never will be the, the uh, a place where the population at large can feel at home. But I'm very anxious to see real ends to a world in which we have a, a minority who are well at home with these things and eager for the latest development, the latest change we can understand in some degree. It's not that they're going to design the software, but they understand what's going on. And then a vast majority who look rather passively at this and worry about its consequences, as indeed well they might. I think it's an unhealthy situation. And the only way to do it is not to have experts who tell you more what's going to, what's going to happen to you. That will not do it. What you have to do is make everyone feel he is at least aware of what those experts can do and cannot do because he has participated. He doesn't fear, or she doesn't fear the poet because you can, you can memorize a poem yourself, you can write a poem, a very bad poem, and almost everyone has done that. Many, many people, 80% of the school children, write something like verse or poetry in good school they can. That's not deathless verse, but it's the same participation. That's what's got to be done for science and engineering. And I think also it has to be done, and this is coming too, it has to be done in another emotional tone. If prose, if learning to read and write were always carried out on successive levels of complexity in contract law or insurance policy technique with parties of the first, second, third, and fourth part and all the codicils and all the careful logic, which is a real skill. It's a real skill and it does make beautiful models of the world suitable for people to sign contracts on. But if you had to learn how to read and write only on that, it'd be a vast illiteracy in the land. <laughs> We learn how to read and write because we use it to describe the moon, to say loving words, to write poems, jokes, graffiti, whatever it is. And science and engineering must play that same role. I believe that it changed the emotional tone. And therefore, I think the artists who are doing it now have to be much encouraged, who are doing what I call playful engineering. Things that use the techniques and even the modalities and the social institutions of the engineer, because you can't do it otherwise, to make useless objects, quote, which don't make money, in the direct way, don't improve health, don't improve foodstuffs, don't make war better, but are part of an improved aesthetic quality of living. And I mention a person I hope is somewhat controversial, the wonderful artist Christo, who made, for example, a fence across Northern California, 25 miles long and 18 feet high, right across from the Petaluma to the sea, which lasted for two weeks, was viewed by Hundreds of thousands of people who flew over to see it, and by millions of people on the ground, went through the whole impact statement, ecology, even had an injunction drawn out against him, but had a wise judge look at the injunction with the, through the blind eye of the telescope and said, yes, it's a very interesting injunction. I must hear it. I will set the date of hearing as two weeks in the future. <laughs> Knowing that Christo's plan had been from the beginning, that this whole event was temporary, the fence would be taken away, the ranchers who had given him the land, right, 
We're given all the materials to use on the farm, the posts, the cloth, the tie lines, the, the turnbuckles. The men would come by, and the women, the crews would do it all, and bury the small concrete footings deep below the ground so that the cows would not be interfered with. The whole thing was gone by the time the injunction hearing was held. So it was wonderful. It was a great event. And uh, I think that it cost uh, $3 million, I think. How was that raised? Solely from the art world, solely from collectors and connoisseurs who wanted to have part of this game. It was a voluntary activity. No doubt some dealers got, you know, a little markup in the course of it, but that's another story. And uh, that can be done. And a movie was made, which is perpetual. It was worth... Many movies are made for more than $3 million that are not as good as that one, I can assure you. <laughs> and there it is. It's part of the world of what we call well, the superstructure of the world. It's very important. And I think that a hundredfold magnification of that would not be too much. Everywhere it should happen. In many different ways. I'm not inventive enough to think of all the ways it can happen. But what I would call engineering is using modern technology and modern social institutions where 50 or 100 people have to work to get something done. You have to have file papers and make plans and have insurance and worry about the uh, impact and all those real things. But applied to purposes which are playful, essentially playful in nature. Since we do many other things, like sports and television and everything else in this domain, we have to do more for science and technology. The fact that those two are viewed always as being of broad economic or diseconomic nature is a very serious defect of the contemporary world until it is cured. Nothing, I think, will go really well. And that's what I think can begin, but will not end in the next decade. Thank you, Bill. That was really marvelous. A great. Uh, that is truly a stimulating beginning uh, for a symposium. And while I can see that everybody is highly stimulated, I'm going to ask that questions and discussion be held until after the break. And like now to switch from the terrain of uh, technology, science, and indeed art, uh, the ter to the terrain of economics and politics, which at least at some level need to take place within the context of what is physically and scientifically possible. Uh, Lester Thoreau uh, is clearly one of the world's most distinguished economists. Uh, I first uh, got to know him in his book, uh, The Zero Sum Society, uh, a book that certainly very, very much shaped my thinking about economics. Uh, but I think I was even more impressed uh, when some years later I had the chance to read The Zero Sum Solution. And even at that point, uh, where I certainly had not yet met Lester, uh, I was extremely impressed by the fact that there was an economist uh, who was not only uh, capable of identifying problems, uh, but also courageous enough uh, to suggest that there may be ways around them. And for those of you who know economists, uh, that is, uh, if not unique, uh, certainly a very, very welcome uh, kind, of, kind of behavior. Uh, more recently, as you all know, uh, Lester has become the dean of the Sloan School. Uh, a school that doesn't have problems, but certainly has opportunities. <laughs> and uh, Lester has, I think, been very, very forceful in uh, helping us to, to see those opportunities uh, and giving us a, a kind of dynamic uh, that I think few schools have had in recent time. Uh, Lester? Uh, let, me, let me start off where, where Phillips left off, because if you think about economics, you can think of what he described as a field science. Uh, by, and by a field science means you can't do experiments in the laboratory. And economics is no better and no worse than something like geology or meteorology, because you just can't take things in the laboratory and see how they really work. Uh, but the other thing that's important to remember is, there's some, as he mentioned, there's some combination of causality plus stochastic statistical error terms. And what people tend to forget in economics is if you were doing econometrics and somebody wanted to say to describe consumption behavior, they would eventually come down to some equation that says, well, consumption behavior is some function of income changes in people's incomes, uh, some function of their net worth, changes in their net worth, interest rates, some demography, whatever all the thing was. And then at the end, they would write plus E, <laughs> where E is a stochastic disturbance term, a random error term. Uh, the, the cosmic gambling, the economic gambling, if you want to speak. And, it, and this E tends to get forgotten because people spent all of their time talking about this, but in some areas, 
more than half the action may be out here in E. E is not a trivial thing at the end that doesn't explain a lot of economic behavior. And so it's terribly important to understand not just in quantum mechanics, uh, do you have these random stochastic disturbances? In some sense, probably in economics, they're even, even more central. And on some of these things, remember, you have to remember that some ideas go from, science, from economics to science, not vice versa. For example, survival of the fittest, which we think of as being associated with Darwin, actually became from an English economist by the name of Spencer, who had it much earlier, and he had the, that idea among human beings. You were going to have survival of the fittest. And in fact, he didn't use the words natural selections, but he had it very closely because he thought you had an obligation to drive other human beings out of business, and that would improve the species. <laughs> uh, and that, that, that was where that term all came from. We set up a social security system for the elderly uh, that is based on the assumption that the elderly are poor and the non-elderly are wealthier. And that one of the purposes of the Social Security system was to bring the per capita standard of living of the elderly up to the level of the non-elderly so that when you cross this magic age 65, you didn't fall into poverty. Well, what we have not done in the United States is in some sense have a victory party because we achieved that goal about six years ago. And we've now got a situation where the average elderly person in the United States has a per capita income 110% of the non-elderly. But we have a system geared up so that every year, the next year it'll be 112, the year after that it'll be 114. Uh, the time to come is to, is to have a victory celebration and say, hey, the purpose of the Social Security system was to bring the elderly up to parity, but not to, to raise them above parity. Now, that doesn't mean you can whop a big lump of money out of the Social Security system, but it does mean you can spend that, slow down the rate of growth of spending. So that if you're talking about cutting the budget over a five-year period of time, you can cut it over a five-year period of time without cutting anybody's income. All you're telling the elderly is, look, your income will grow at the same pace as GNP. It won't grow faster than GNP, which is what it's been doing for the last 20 years. And there again, there's a lot of consensus on part of both Republicans and Democrats. And now you're talking about big bucks. Now, if you look at the, the, the Medicare part of it, there's a, a place where there's very consensus anal uh, consistent analysis, but the question is, what do you do about it? And what you do about it really depends on making some ethical social judgments. Med the Medicare program, which is the elderly program for the elderly, and the medical program for the elderly, spends well over $100 billion. 40% of the money goes to people in the six months before they die. You get a diagnosis, terminal cancer, we give you $100,000 worth of treatment, and you die. Exactly like the doctor said would happen. But somehow in that circumstance, as a society, we don't find it possible to accept the diagnosis, terminal. We, in essentially, just have to throw treatments at that problem, even though we know the treatments won't work. AIDS is a perfect example. We have never cured anybody with AIDS, but we spend $150,000 on each person. Not even obvious we're lengthening their lives that much. And the question is, how much of that as a society are, can you afford and do you want to afford? And so if you say, you know, I, I could cut Medicare, by $40 billion and change effectively American uh, length of life, not at all. But of course it would require a change in attitude because you have to then accept the fact that when the doctor says you will die, we don't have these heroic throw resources at the problem, which won't work. You know, and so it's those kind of problems you have to answer on the budget side. Most of them are not economic problems, and most of them are essentially social value political decisions that you want to do those things. Once you want to cut the federal budget, uh, then you, you can very quickly focus in on those things where there are some legitimate arguments as to why those are the things we ought to change. Uh, and so here again, I think the real problem is saying, hey, we've got to do it. And once you come to that conclusion, I don't think it's a terribly difficult problem. Sure. Uh, a lot of the problem you're talking about right now just predicated on the fact that people don't understand and they don't want to understand. Don't we have a, a public educational process on our hands? I mean, you mentioned the fact you pick up the newspaper in the middle of, of the United States, you can't even read about international news. Now, it seems to be some movement, and I guess we're part of that community now, too, in, in cor corporate America, if you will, to help educate the general populace. I mean, we do have associations with unions. We do have associations with the workplace. Uh, is that something we need to do more? Well, I think, I think the answer is yes, because we need publication, public education in the best sense of the word. But the problem is that the education that various private groups do, companies, unions, whomever, all is terribly self-interested and self-serving.
and therefore gets discounted by everybody. Because what does the corporate community say the solution to every problem in the world is? Cut the corporate income tax. Have you ever heard a group of corporate businessmen say anything else? That's always the number one thing they think would make America better. And even if you think that's true, if you put that on your list, nobody will pay any attention to what the business community says. Because the business community looks self-interested and self-serving, even if it isn't. Uh, and so I, th I think you know, the, the problem on this, this kind of thing is you, and the thing that gets listened to is the thing that isn't in your immediate self-interest. Because people say, my God, the guy must be serious because he's proposing something. Well, here he will take a little bit of the, of the bad part of this proposal rather than somebody else in the society will take all the bads and he will get all the goods. Uh, and so I think the answer is yes, we do need public education, but it, it's got to be seen in the, you know, what makes the world economy work better? What makes the American economy work better as opposed to something that looks like this is going to make me and my firm wealthier? And too much of uh, corporate education always falls into this category of looking incredibly self-serving. Don? Uh, just building, building on that question of, of public edu education, it seems that there, if, if I follow that, in terms of the advances that we've made in communication here in the United States, we've always prided ourselves in an open, open environment in terms of communication. Um, and we therefore set up a system of in terms of communications from a, uh, basically public television is still self-funding from, from many different agencies wherever we're, we're located. But it seems to me we've come to a point now with the, with the education issue, with the, the access to, to everyone here, you know, we're, we're certainly an educated group, but there are many people that don't have access and we have a lot of people watching TV that are very young, that maybe there's a time for, for a role for a, a government-sponsored TV station or public broadcasting that provides, you know, access and communication and infrastructure to our people, whether they're young or old. And, I mean, the, the question of what goes on that agenda, somebody else can decide, and that becomes a very social issue. But do you feel, uh, or how do you feel in that, in that sense? Well, see, I think one of the things corporate America could do for the United States, is, you know, corporate America sponsors a lot of those programs on public television. Uh, how about a program that just shows how the rest of the world lives? See, most Americans don't know. I mean, take Korea. Most Americans think that's MASH. It's illiterate peasants in straw huts that are slightly dirty. Because that's the only, only time in their lives they've ever seen Korea, is on that particular program. And of course, any of us who've been to Korea since the Korean War know that the relationship between that vision of Korea and the modern vision of Korea is absolutely zero. See, I think, you know, the kind of, the, the, I'm going to say something that's going to sound like a college professor shouldn't say it. I think no idea has ever tr persuaded any human being of anything. That's a little strong, but what, explain, what persuades human beings that they're wrong is events. And once the event persuades you that the old idea is wrong, then you're open to new ideas. And so the question inside the United States and that kind of thing is, how do you persuade, persuade America, show Americans events that persuades them that they've got to change their view of the rest of the world? Well, one event is, you know, like not a year or so ago, my wife and I were in Korea, and we went to the Daewoo assembly lines outside Seoul. Well, the Daewoo assembly lines would shake up anybody because you know, the floors gleam like they're marble. Newest Japanese and German automobile making facilities, bright, young, kind of junior college educated, 27-year-old labor force, German engineers doing the design and engineering, and they're making Pontiac Le Mans's. There aren't any Americans in the facility. Well, you know, that's the kind of event that says, hey, maybe the world really is different. And you, could, you can kind of vaguely know they make cars abroad. But seeing that actually happening is the kind of thing that may <coughs> lead you to believe, hey, I should look at the world in a different way. And, uh, you know, that you know, I was mentioning during the break, there are 244 million Americans. How many of us do you think have passports? Passports last for 10 years. So if you don't have a passport, you're not going to leave the United States. And it's getting even harder to go to Mexico and Canada without a passport. The answer is 26 million. So only one out of every nine Americans ever plans to leave the United States. I mean, that just isn't true in most of the rest of the world. Jane? Um, this is a little off the topic, but I see the You have the microphone there. I see the AIDS problem as having the potential for creating a, a great random um, disturbance in the economies of the world. Um, in future, and I was wondering if you've seen any evidence of the pooling of uh, um, research or te technology and assets of countries and or corporations in um, finding a way to cope with this, the, the impact that this problem can have in future. 
You want to talk about well, it's been taken part? very seriously by the WHO. Yeah. And in the last two or three years, the initial response of many third world countries with very small resources in public health and not much political power in those, in those agencies, they, the domestic agencies that deal with it, are slowly changing to an explicit recognition of the seriousness of the problem. And there's no doubt about it that it was internationally ill-regarded a few years ago because it was so closely tied, more or less what Dean was saying, to the self-serving air of vacation resorts, not wanting people to be, feel that there was any danger in going to these places. But now this is being overcome by a sense of reality. There really is not much wrong with these issues in the world that would not be solved by a desire to tell the truth and tell people what evidence is instead of making everything in terms of what you can calculate is your best interest on a short term. That's really what is behind all of these superstructure problems. See, AIDS is, is another interesting thing where I know a cure to AIDS, not a cure to the disease, but how to stop AIDS. The problem with AIDS is the ways in which it is spread, we, all of the ways, homosexuality, prostitution, premarital sex, all of those things, all of the ways that it is spread we regard as immoral. And therefore, anything you do to make sure it is not spread in those activities is seen as encouraging that immoral activity. And for example, saturate the world with clean, clean needles, needles, condoms, et cetera. You can stop AIDS without understanding anything about the virus. Right. But people will stop you from doing that because they say, if you do that, you are encouraging these immoral activities. It's actually happening in Boston, Massachusetts. Yes. So this, yeah. At this day, there's a huge fight for the past six months for a trial program for 200 persons to give to exchange needles. And it can't be done. The, the, the and see, that's like saying back in the, the good old days in the 19th century, I didn't know how to stop pneumonia, but I did know how to pick up horse manure off the streets. Yeah. And by picking up, that's where public that's, sanitation came from. By right. picking horse manure off the streets, I stopped pneumonia, even yeah. though I couldn't cure pneumonia. <laughs> and so we know how to stop AIDS socially. We don't know how to stop AIDS medically. But we get ourselves into this tremendous fight uh, about an issue that's peripheral. Now, see, we've had it before. The Catholic Church is against cremation. At the time of the Black Death in Europe, the Catholic Church had to back down for 100 years and encourage cremation because the effective way to stop the plague was cremation. Uh, and at the beginning of, and they knew that, but at the beginning of the Black Death period, the church fought the idea of cremation. But when the, the, the numbers of deaths got up to the certain level, the Catholic Church changed its mind and started to allow cremation. Well, on some, you know, if the, if the plague gets bad enough, we're going to have to change our mind and say, hey, it, the, the slight encouragement that clean needles gives to drug usage is not important relative to stopping AIDS, and therefore we will do it. But the question is, how do you speed up that process rather than, than slow it down? Or if you need to go through the bad experience before you will accept that. Now, isn't, so isn't economically, there? AIDS doesn't make much difference, see, because how many people are dying now? Eight, ten thousand? We kill 55,000 people a year on the highways and don't That's notice right. it. And so the answer is, you, now the place we will notice it is in the medical care system. And the way that we'll notice in the medical care system is effectively in the United States, it will force us 10 years from now to have a different medical care system. Mm -hmm. yep. And it will force it on this issue of, you know, throw a lot of resources at a hopeless case because take your favorite estimate of AIDS for 1993, multiply it by your favorite cost per year, and you will get a mind-boggling number. It seems to me that there's sort of a theme running through this discussion. It seems to me that what we're saying is there are problems out there. Uh, problems are soluble. Uh, that a lot of the solution to problems has to do with priorities, uh, that priorities are often, at least in our view, distorted uh, by political and ideological and attitudinal uh, reality. I think, you know, we can kind of get a sense of that. And I guess I may be the last in the world of the naive technological optimists, but, you know, I've kind of always kind of approached problems with the, with the idea that maybe not for all of them, uh, but for at least an awful lot of them, uh, there's a technological solution, and you know, obviously we could talk about that in the context of AIDS, uh, but I think even in some of these other contexts, uh, you know, some of these problems of uh, waste disposal uh, that David has uh, sort of at least you know, gotten us into, uh, I don't understand why Philip and his friends uh, can't invent some super, super macro laser disintegrator <laughs> uh, like we used to see in you know, the movie serials when I was growing up and get rid of all that stuff. I mean, I don't understand why science and technology isn't making more of a contribution to this problem. No, they can do it, but you have to pay for it. You don't get a free one. I mean, even in the movies, they didn't have free super laser. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it's, it's literally not a problem. I can't believe that it's a serious problem from the point of view, can we do it if we willed? But we don't will. I must also add that the federal government has a considerable sum, not the biggest sum, in the Defense Department, $300 million. Yeah. Now, it's very hard for me to believe that we would not be a safer country if we spent $50 billion less every year. And I've wrote a book on the subject, and I really studied rather hard. And I tried to be as dispassionate about it as possible, accepting what seemed to be rather Baroque principles of American foreign policy, but even accepting those principles. So you do a better job of defending what you have if you don't take quite such a stance to run everywhere around the world and bash people on the head. And you know you can't really bash people on the head who can bash you back because that's too dangerous. <laughs> so you take it out in the Grenadians. Well, it's, it's very strange. That's going to happen too. I, I guarantee that the budget of 2010 will not contain the equivalent of the American military budget, which has grown so splendidly since 1950. OK. DR? Uh, on the economic front, presently, there are two contradictory trends visible. One is the industrialized societies or uh, countries are getting integrated and there's globalization. On the other hand, uh, one uh, sees the trend of protectionism. Now, which you think would be the most uh, dominant theme in the next decade? Well, see, let me start off on, on what you first mentioned. It's interesting to no notice the difference because you're, you're focusing in on it. In the 19... 30s, or prior to the 1930s, there was a very conventional view of what international trade is. International trade is industrial countries making products, selling them to third world countries, and buying raw materials. And that partly came about because of the colonies that existed prior to World War II. Britain traded with its colonies, and that was the pattern. Britain made manufactured products, and the colonies paid for those manufactured products with raw materials. Since World War II, almost all of the growth in world trade has been between wealthy industrial countries. And in fact, because of the scientific revolution, raw materials are becoming much less important. And it isn't just the end of the Iron Age, it's the end of the raw material age in the sense of things that are in scarce supply. Look at the units of GNP per ton of steel consumed. The United States today, including imports, consumes one-third less steel than we did in 1960, one-third less iron products than we did in 1960, and the GNP is twice as big. But the same thing's true of copper, zinc, any of those things you can think of. Uh, and, of course, those were the traditional exports of poor, underde underdeveloped countries. And so you do have this, this situation where the developed world was uh, essentially integrating with itself. Now, the thing that should be said is in the post-World War II, we had countries genuinely move from underdeveloped to at least quasi-developed. The Koreas, the Taiwans, the Hong Kongs, the Singapores, the Brazils, etc. There, there were some great success stories in that thing. Now, you notice I don't have Japan in that category because... As far as an economist is concerned, Japan has never been an underdeveloped country. Japan has occasionally been poor, but never underdeveloped. The Industrial Revolution began in the early 19th century. And in 1830, and if you want to look at uh, Reischauer's book on the Japanese, it's fascinating. In 1830, all the evidence is that the standards of literacy in Japan were higher than they were in Great Britain. More people could read and write in Japan than could read and write in Great Britain at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and so when the Meiji Restoration came along, and again after World War II when the country was bombed, Japan was poor compared to the rest of the world, but it was never underdeveloped. It had an educated, skilled workforce potentially, and a very well-developed, integrated central government that was able and willing to provide the infrastructure. And so Japan has gone from poor to rich, but it's very important to understand that Japan has not gone from underdeveloped to developed. Japan has always been part of the developed world. And of course, we can see that if you look at the military stuff. They beat the Russians in the Sino-Soviet <coughs> War before 1900. And they fight the United States to a draw in World War II for three or four years. You don't do that if you're an underdeveloped country. Uh, and so, you know, but we have had, had, had successes along that, along that line. But yes, you're right. All, all the growth in world trade, uh, with the exception of energy, oil, uh, has basically been between developed countries. And uh, with regard to the question as to whether you expect more protectionism or more globalization. Well, the, the, the protectionism really depends on whether we can turn this stagnant growth around. If you assume the world economy is going to continue to slow down, then we're all going to become protectionists. Because in, in a stagnant world economy, every import is a job lost. And everybody will see the job loss when the import comes in, and they won't see the job gains when the exports go out. Uh, 
the thing that allows open trade is a world that's growing fast enough so that when you lose a job because of imports, you know that isn't the end of the world. The economy is going to be generating other jobs and you're going to have better options. And so, for, of course, you, you can see it if you look at Germany and the steel business. In the 1960s, the Germans were importing steel, no problem. 1980s, they pass a whole set of restrictions to keep Brazilian steel out. Because in the 1980s, it looks to a German steel worker like a ton of Brazilian steel means a German lo job lost on a quasi-permanent basis, while in the 1960s, with a 1% unemployment rate, the loss of a German steel making job was not a terribly onerous thing. Tom? I'd like to go back to the question Fred asked originally. Suppose the new president called you in and asked for your recommendation on whether to implement these solutions now or wait until 1993. What would you recommend? And what pace would you recommend implementing them? Uh, you know, that, I think the sooner you start, the better. Uh, not from a political point of view, but from an economic point of view, because, see, the longer you wait, the bigger the changes that have to be made. Because this debt's grown at the rate of 200 plus billion dollars a year, which means the changes that have to occur in the structure of the world economy get bigger. You know, if you do it on January 1st, 1988, you've got to go from 170 billion dollar American deficit to plus 43. If you do it on January 1st, 1989, you've got to go from minus 170 to plus 70. And if you wait till 1993, you're probably talking about going from minus 170 to plus something like, I don't know, 170. And so the longer you wait, the bigger the change. And of course, from the point of view of the world economy, it's absolute madness to have one of the wealthiest economies in the world borrowing all of the world's money. You know, if there's money in, in the world to be lent, it to, for economic development purposes, it shouldn't be lent to Americans, it should be lent to poor countries who need it in terms of their economic development. And so from the point of view of both, in some sense, the American long-run interest and the world's long-run interest, the quicker you do it, the better. Uh, now, the, the problem is you can't do it alone. If you say how fast do you do these things, the question is how fast can you, how, how much cooperation can you get from the Germans and Japanese? Because, you know, you wouldn't want to cure the American budget <coughs> tomorrow if that's all that happened. Because all of a sudden, we would take $200 billion worth <coughs> of demand out of the world economy. That's 5 million jobs. 3 million of them would be in the United States. 2 million of them would be abroad. That's called a world recession. You need them to do something at exactly the same time the United States is doing something. And so the answer of how fast depends on how fast can you organize it uh, with at least those two other big actors in the world. Because you've got to do this, you've got to do this in harmony. It isn't something you can do by yourself. Peter? On the same subject. You have explained to us how in the last eight years the U.S. has lived beyond its means, mainly financed by foreigners, which probably means that they have paid for some of the excesses of the U.S. Now, you have also explained to us that in the future the U.S. will have to become a net exporter, which means that jobs will move to the U.S. Doesn't that mean that the U.S. wins twice, once living beyond its means and then having the jobs that the others lose that finance that before? No, but remember, there's a third part of it, and that is we'll work for lower wages. If somebody gives me a job but at a 50% wage reduction, uh, from the point of view of an economist, that's a negative. Because I, I have to give up hours of leisure, and I get paid less. Uh, and so it helps you in terms of the unemployment rate. Uh, but the name of the game is not minimizing the unemployment rate. The name of the game is maximizing purchasing power. And see, Americans are going to get lower purchasing power because if you do what we do, what we've done is moved our, see, what, what lending and borrowing does is allow you to move your income across time. It doesn't raise or lower your total income. We have moved some of the income we would have in the 1990s to the 1980s by borrowing money from the rest of the world, which at some point we're going to pay interest on and we're going to pay back. And it, when we start to pay interest and when we start to pay it back, our standard of living will be below what it otherwise would have been. And so we've shifted our standard of living around in a, on, a, on a time basis. And so we haven't got something for nothing, and we don't win twice. Uh, now, the only way we win twice is to default. Because if we borrow it and then don't pay it, then we've won twice. Herb? In the past several weeks, we heard about the 
lack of competitiveness in, from United States in the world marketplace. And key element in that seems to be the productivity issue. And I would very much like to hear Professor Morrison and uh, Dean Thoreau, your comments on how can we uh, improve on the productivity issue from the viewpoint of uh, technology, management techniques, and education, and specifically, what do you think the industry can do uh, along these lines? Well, I feel very modest about this. I know absolutely nothing about industrial productivity. I know something about education. I feel that the American history of education has been excellent, but it has been cut off lately. It is not as good as it ought to be. We need a much greater uh, concern and investment, probably concern more than investment, and so on. Those are the things which I've said. I said something about it from the point of view of a broad, forward-looking social attitude, entirely apart from the question of productivity. I'm sure the two accompany each other, but I would have to defer to Dean Thorne to talk about the rest. But let, let me talk about two things. You know, people use this word competitiveness and, and low productivity growth, and it's important to separate the two. Because, see, if you think about the trade deficit problem, we are not talking about a long-run problem. In 1982, the United States had a $30 billion trade surplus. In 1987, it's minus 170. Now, you, you know, this is a measure of becoming less competitive, but something happened in that period of time. One of the things that happened in the period of that time, we went from 170 yen to the dollar to 280 yen to the dollar. And so that means if you're an American firm that was, had costs exactly equal to your Japanese competitor back there in 1980, by the time you got to 1984 and 85, your costs were 30% or 50% above your Japanese competitor, not because you had done anything lousy at all, simply because the value of the dollar had switched. Now, we're now back down to a, Jap a rate of something close to 120, and American firms are going to become more competitive. But if, remember, this is not a desirable thing. It may be a necessary thing, but it's not desirable because this is effectively the way I reduce my wages. Because at 160 yen to the dollar, Japanese manufacturing wages equal American manufacturing wages. So if, so if the two firms are equally efficient in terms of management, uh, equipment, et cetera, they run even at 160 yen to the dollar. If it's above 160, the Japanese has the edge in terms of labor cost. If it's below 160, the American firm has the edge in terms of the labor cost. Now, if American firms can't compete at 120, it means the Japanese firm on everything else is 30 to 40 percent better when it comes to management, equipment, technology, everything but uh, the amount that you have to pay, pay the workforce. Now, we can, we can talk, if you like, about why isn't the trade deficit getting better faster, and let me do that in a minute. But there's that competitiveness problem which relates to what we've really been talking about this morning, which is this kind of macroeconomic problem. The other problem that you mentioned is the low productivity growth, which in the United States is about 0.8 percent per year. And the rest of the industrial world is averaging about three plus, uh, and so we're running at about the rate of one third to one quarter of the, uh, what's happening in other developed, uh, other advanced countries. Now, the important thing to understand is if you just looked at manufacturing, we're running at a rate approximately equal to the rate in the rest of the world. The low productivity growth in the United States is all outside of the manufacturing sector. We've got lots of industry in the United States with falling productivity, like finance. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's a bit of a mis mystery. If you take banks, you've got computerized accounting, and the ATM machines are the uh, robots of the banking industry, and bank productivity has gone down 1% a year every year for the last seven years. And so outside of the manufacturing center, you, you see a kind of a double mystery. First of all, a very low rate of growth of productivity or even negative. At the same time, you've had all this technology put in, mostly information technology, that should have made those places uh, work better. And then the, then, the, then the question you have to ask yourself is, what's going wrong? Now, see, the, the other thing that points in the same direction uh, that kind of put, put, when people say the word productivity, you tend to think of a factory problem. In fact, that isn't where the problem is in the United, in the United States. I don't have the exact numbers with me, but if you take the period from 78, to 87, you'll find something like the following. If you looked at blue-collar workers in America, the number of blue-collar workers in America has gone down by about one and a half million people, which is about 5% of the blue-collar workforce. 
over this period of time, real output has gone up by about 20%, which means that productivity on the factory floor in a nine-year period of time has gone up by about 25%. You know, which is a little less than 3% and a little off the world rate, but not much. If you look at your offices, white collar workers, now this leaves service workers out. Service occupations are not included in this data. You will find that American firms have added 11 million white collar workers to their payroll, which is a, about a 25% increase in white collar employment. So we've got no productivity out of the office because you've produced 25% more with 25% more. That's zero productivity. And American firms have 61 million white collar workers on their payrolls and 30 million blue collar workers on their payrolls. The American productivity problem is located in the office in this tremendous white collar bureaucracy that you all are adding. And see, you read things in the paper which just aren't true when you look at the statistics. Like you read in the paper that every American firm is trying to become lean and mean and reduce the layers of white management, right? And you read these horror stories periodically in the press that such and such a firm is going to lay off 20,000 white collar workers over the next five years. The interesting thing about those stories is if you go back three years later, it's almost never happened. And if you look at the aggregate numbers, it isn't happening. Because in 1987, our economy grew at 2.6% in real terms. Guess how many managers we added to American payrolls in 1987? 5.7%. So we were adding managers to the American payroll twice as fast as you were adding output. Now, the American payroll is your payroll, not the American payroll. And so you tell me why American firms have to do this and why American firms can't manage their office. See, that's where the heart of the problem is. It's not, it's not out there on the factory floor. <coughs> Dean Brown, you have mentioned that uh, the aggregate index will not be the correct figure to look at in the future. So from a multinational corporation point of view, what is the index that we should be looking at in the future years to come? In what sense? In the economic index. You have mentioned to the president that the aggregate index it's not really Well, what I, what I said is he can't just look at the American economy. He's got to look wider than the American economy because many of the important things that are going to affect Americans are going to happen in the rest of the world. If you have stagnation in Germany, it doesn't just affect Germans. It's going to affect everybody else in the world because it's going to slow down the whole world economy given the way it's constructed. Uh, and it's exactly, exactly like an OPEC oil shock. If Saudi Arabia does something and you have an OPEC oil shock, it's going to cause inflation in all of the world. And see, we traditionally in the United States, and certainly American presidents, think of the world where if something goes wrong in America, there is a cure in America. Perfect example, take the Brady Commission, which was this report on the stock market crash. It was all rubbish, absolute rubbish, but very good American rubbish. Because what it said was the New York Stock Exchange crashed and it, first of all, it ignored the entire world. The crash actually was going by, for six hours before New York opened. The crash began in London. And so if in some sense, if you were looking for a precipitating event, you would have looked for something in London. The, the, the Brady Report barely mentions that stock markets and the rest of the world crashes. And then it, it comes to its solution, which of course, or its, its cause, its devil, which was, of course, the computer. You know, if your package doesn't arrive, what's wrong? Well, the computer goofed it up. If the stock market crashed, what's wrong? Well, of course, it has to be the computer in the modern world. They, it goofs up everything. But they, so they said, well, it's portfolio insurance and program trading. They don't do that in London very much. How can something that's not done in London start a stock market crash in London? Well, maybe you could have told a sophisticated story as to how that happened, but they didn't do that. They assumed that what happened on October 9th is completely solvable inside the United States. No such thing. We have integrated world capital markets. Many of the same firms are listed in London, New York, and Tokyo. If one of them falls, the other's got to fall because they're, they're measuring the same stocks uh, to some extent. And it's those kind of things where I think you need a big change in American attitudes, both at the top and the bottom, because there is, you know, if, you, if you think of the New York financial market, it's just part of the world financial market. And it doesn't even have to be Americans. If you go to London, the British firms are not the biggest player in the London market. The British market share is well below that of either the United States or the Japanese in the London market. 
Uh, and so you can be a world financial capital without your firms being dominant in your own geographic capital. And it's those kind of things where I was arguing you have to look at different numbers. Does that, make, uh, does that mean that the multinational corporations will be um, having to pay more attention to the finance instead of uh, production? No, I, I, don't think, I don't think it means, means that, but, but see, I, I think the, the trick you're going to have to think about, I would argue that there, I know what you mean by a multinational firm, but in my sense, there are no, almost no American multinational firms. There are almost no Japanese multinational firms. There are almost no German multinational firms. If by a multinational firm, you want to mean that really integrates across different societies and groups. The only multinational firms that really exist come from small countries like Switzerland, Holland, Sweden. Because if you're Philips, you can't run Philips as a Dutch corporation. If you're Volvo, you can't run Volvo as a Swedish corporation because most of your employees are not in Sweden. Most of your markets are not in Sweden. Take big American firms that like to think of themselves as multinational and ask yourself, how many of the top 15 executives aren't Americans? Do the same thing for German and Japanese firms. And if your definition of a multinational firm is one that has a significant fraction of top management that isn't a native of that country, there are, I, I think somebody told me in IBM there's one such person. Right. There's one non-American in the top 15. And, you know, and there are a lot of, you can't find any Japanese firm with a non-Japanese who would be one of the top 15 people in that firm. Debbie? When uh, Herb was asking you about uh, what changes do you think then American management have to be making in the next 10 to 15 years? Well, let me pick up on that again and come back to it, and then I'll throw the question to Philip. See, if you look at it from an economist's point of view on the productivity side, with, in, relating to the technology, the interesting thing is for some reason American firms do very little work on process technologies. If you look at the, the scientific things, I was recently asked to write an article for Science Magazine that came out in the middle of December, and they asked on an interesting topic. The question I was supposed to write on is, why are Americans slow to adopt new technologies? And that's a very interesting question because 20 years ago they wouldn't have asked the question. Because if they had asked the question, the answer would have been, Americans are not slow, the editors of this journal are stupid, why did you ever ask such a silly <laughs> question? End of article. Today it's not a stupid question. And so I... Uh, essentially investigated that topic and wrote on it. And what you find if you look at it seriously, I broke it down into three different parts. First part is, are we behind in the sense of having consumers willing to buy new things? Are we behind in the sense of having scientists and engineers who invent new things? Or are we behind in the sense of having firms who are behind in terms of process technologies and therefore they can't produce new things at competitive costs? Well, if you look if you look at the question about new products, the answer is the United States is not behind. Recently, a group of people tried to find the leaders, and they divided all of science and engineering into nine categories. They tried to find, identify the human beings that were the leaders in this technology, where they were located, and rate countries based on who, leaded, who led in these various technologies. Now, of the nine technologies, they came to the conclusion Americans led on five, Americans were tied for first on two, and they were second on two. Well, if you have five firsts, two ties, and two seconds, you're clearly the number one country. Now, the thing that was different on that dimension is there was a definite challenger. Every time we were number one, Japan was number two. Every time we were tied for number one, it was with Japan. And everywhere we were number two, they were number one. And so the first thing that was different is that since World War II, we have not had a scientific challenger. Now, before World War II, we did. It was Germany. But since World War II, until recently, we haven't had it. Uh, but we're ahead. Now, if you look at the consumer and you say, are Americans slow to buy new things? The first reaction is to smile. Can't be true. We're leading edge consumers. <laughs> but it is true. There are getting to be an increasing number of things that for sale in the rest of the world that are not for sale in the United States, like digital tape recorders, higher resolution television sets, a number of drugs. If you ask why is the American economy slow on those consumption items, there's always a standard answer. We get ourselves tied up in legal knots. Like we don't have digital tape recorders because the music industry is suing the hardware industry. Uh, CBS was suing Sony. That's why Sony bought CBS. It was cheaper than paying the lawyers. <laughs> but a legal system can be a handicap. If you have a legal system that's slow, expensive, and cumbersome, it's going to 
be an economic handicap. Uh, but now that brings you to the process technologies. And see, when you, when you think of the process technologies, there it's hard to find a place where Americans are the leaders. If you want steel rolled to the highest precisions, the Germans do it. If you want silica made with the least impurities, the Japanese do it. If you want the robot that can place something the closest within them, uh, in terms of microns from where it belongs, the Swedes do it. And when you come to these process technologies, you just see an American scientific industrial establishment which seems to be behind. And so I will now throw the question over well, to as to why you think we're behind on process technology. First, I'm not so sure that the, the, that statement is quite right. I strongly suspect that a lot of these firms are licensed by American patent holders. A lot of them, not everything, because we do have a big competitor now. But the, it's the investment to carry it to the floor. It's the, whatever goes into the bottom line calculations that make the difference. It's the whole look at, at what the future is like. Well, I can only give an example. I know very little about this, but I can give examples from my own trade. A couple of weeks ago, we heard a brilliant talk by one of the people in the MIT physics department who gave a compelling, if not absolutely yet sure, uh, theory of the high temperature superconductor, which people are looking for. And one of the things he said about it was that they determined to make the experiments which, on which this rested by getting large single crystals of the material, which had never been grown before. Now, the growing of crystals is a wonderful technical art. It's between a scientific and a, an artistic endeavor. It's quite scientific, but it requires great care and great specificity of interest. You can't grow A and then know you can grow B, C, and D. Each one was handled separately. In the whole United States, he said, he managed. There's a small group at MIT, not faculty level, but very good people, engaged in material science department. He took over their entire work for six months in order to get this done. Meanwhile, they had friends elsewhere. And he enlisted for his support people of the very highest level, faculty people and biggest firms in Japan, to do this work for him on a contractual basis as, as, co as partners. In all the United States, he said, and I don't know if he could prove this, but he did not know of a single faculty member in any physics department in the United States who was a specialist in crystal growing. He did not know of a single good physics department in Japan that did not have such a professor. That's not because there was any special economic demand for this for high temperature. It was because everyone realized that it's a thing you have to be able to do, even though it may not have the in some ways, the greatest expectation of large breakthroughs. But it's a, it's a necessary part of the competence of an industrial society. We don't finance it. We don't have people going into it. There are no jobs. There are no rewards. And we don't have any in the entire country. This is some kind of an indication of what's going on. Yeah, see, I think it's this organization thing, because MIT came to the conclusion a few years ago that this is one of the places where we weren't living up to our responsibilities. Because if you look at the scientists and engineers who graduate from MIT, none of them go off to do process research or That's run right. process things, except for chemical engineers. Uh, and it, the question was why? Well, one, one answer is those kind of problems don't automatically pop up in the university environment. We don't run processes at MIT, and therefore we don't automatically see process problems in our scientific laboratories. And so the decision was made that MIT should set up a program, which we actually are starting in June, and call Leaders in Manufacturing, designed to turn out people who were scientifically good in process technologies. Uh, very quickly, you come to the conclusion you can't do it in the engineering school because there's a huge management component. Because the minute you start talking about processes, you're talking about getting human beings to do things together and changing what human beings do. And so there's got to be a management component into process engineering that doesn't have to be there if you're just doing design work. So the, the program became a joint program between the Sloan School and the School of Engineering here at MIT. Uh, but then we had to recruit some industrial partners. Now, part of the problem was getting some industrial partners who would give us some money. That was the minimum part of the problem. The other part was getting a group of firms who would, in some sense, let us use their production processes as our laboratories. That was the much harder problem. Not because they didn't think this was a good idea, but because it would have a long run payoff, and in the short run, it would be disruptive. Because you're going to have some strangers who are going to occupy some of your own employees' time running around your processes. They're going to want to do experiments. You know, the throughput in the short run is going to be a little less than it might be if you didn't have such people running around your facilities. But as the dean of engineering and I went around trying to sell this problem, program, it's clear there was something else. Processes in production in American companies is the dumping grounds. You pay the lowest salaries, you give the slowest promotions, and everybody perceives it as Siberia. 
in terms of in, in getting ahead in the industrial world. And very few companies say, if you don't learn how to do this, you won't make it to the top. The companies give exactly the opposite signals. The right way to get to the top is to go into finance, go into marketing, anything but actually building the stuff. And we actually had company presidents from leading American companies say to us with no sarcasm, we're not sure we need smart people in production. That's what they said. Uh, and if you, know, if you do that, then it shouldn't be surprised that you don't have world-class performance. You aren't allocating your world-class people to that activity. There's an MIT Commission on Industrial Competitiveness, or Industrial Productivity, and we had Young from Hewlett Packard here. Now, I regard Hewlett Packard as one of America's premier firms. He said the thing he was proudest of in his tenure at Hewlett Packard was for the first time in the history of Hewlett Packard, the pay and promotion curve for production engineers was as fast as it was for design engineers. Well, if it's just true at Hewlett Packard, my God, what is it? What it is in the rest of American industry? And you know, if 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 you don't treat people as first-class citizens in an activity, first-class people won't go into that activity. And I so I think one of the things you have to ask about American industry is how did they slip into the habit of saying producing this stuff is a second-class activity? The first-class activity is selling it, financing it, designing it, everything but producing it. And see, I think that's the heart of the problem. Once you decide that you're willing to pay a competitive wage for production engineers, an MIT new engineer will go to work for you in that capacity. But if you say to them, hey, we're going to give you $40,000 in design, and we'll give you $25,000 if you go to production, what MIT 22-year-old is going to take that deal? They're all going to go into design. And that's what you've been essentially offering our graduates, about $15,000 a year more to go into design than you would offer our graduates to go into production. And they're not stupid. Tom? In the areas of technology, uh, in the next decade, what do you think are the most important mega projects? And I, I'm thinking specifically about such things as the superconducting super collider or mapping the human genome or any others that you might think are as important or more important. And how do you rate these? Well, I don't want to appear to be negative on these things. I think those are both wonderful projects. I would be very enthusiastic with either one of them. I don't think it makes a great deal of difference, in fact, whether they're done or not, except as, a, as it bears upon morale and long-range intention. Of course, these are fine things to do, and they ought to be done, and it's hard to ask people to wait. But the, the consequence of doing it is not something that is tied to the year 1988 or any other year. It's really part of the same problem, it's an attitudinal problem. Do we want to grow? Do we want to do something that will be valuable in future in a way we don't know quite how? Then let's do it. Let's do it at a considerable scale. We can afford that. That's, that's all I can say. See, let, let I, me make a comment here about, let, you know, if you think... Can I make a remark? Just, yeah. well, I want to quote one person. I want to quote Frank Yang, a very, very famous physicist, American theorist, who's Chinese in origin. He became, strangely enough, 10 or 15 years ago, a good friend and confidant to Chairman Mao himself. This is a true story. And he tried to convince the Chinese physicists, and with them, eventually, of course, the chairman, who he spoke to every once in a while, that perhaps the wisest thing for China to do was not at that time to build a large accelerator, which would cost a lot of money, a lot of talent. They were just barely able to do it. Start small, build a few, spread the, the enterprises. Yet people, the community has to be built first. And that was sound advice. They didn't like to take it. And finally, Chairman Rao said to him at a certain point, he reported this to me directly, I believe it. He said, you know, it's very well what you say, and there's a lot of sense to it, but the same, we are not a rich country. At the same time, we have made some progress. We are rich enough to make a disinterested contribution to the knowledge of all mankind. And that was from this man. Well, see, now, that's extraordinary. That, uh, I, don't, I don't know many American presidents who would say that in public. Well, see, the other thing is, you know, one, one of the things people have, you have to understand is it's very hard to figure out what's going to pay off where and why. Yeah. Take, take one of the things that, that Professor Morrison mentioned uh, about the whole question about public sanitation and lengthening life expectancy and all of that. You know, economic historians have a fun problem. They're, you know, after the Black Death, when European populations were grossly lowered, there came a period of time when all of a sudden population and life expectancy exploded. There are a number of theories as to why this happened, but one is the underwear theory. This is about the period of time people switched from wool to cotton underwear. Cotton underwear could easily be washed, and with the washing of cotton underwear, you suddenly had many less genital diseases, and you had a much healthier population. 
And so the single most important thing that led to this, uh, you know, the, the modern world of lengthening life expectancy is somebody, and cotton had been around for thousands of years, wool had been around for thousands of years, but people effectively find a shift from wool to cotton underwear, and all of a sudden the quality of human life improves. Well, that's not something, you know, you just kind of, it happened, but it's not the kind of thing you predict. See, you also mentioned the introduction of electricity, which clearly was a revolution. But it's fun to go back and read about these introductions of these technologies and think about it in a counterfactual sense. Because I'm going to tell you where electricity first came into the world economy, and I think if other developments had happened, it wouldn't, electricity would have been delayed for about half a century. First place, electricity was used to light ships, wooden ships, because the thing that destroyed wooden ships was not storms, but fires. A tremendous fraction of all the wooden ships that set out in the seas burned because you had to have lights and they were lamps. Uh, and for the first use of electricity for 20 years, the only place electricity in terms of lighting was really effectively used was on wooden ships. But suppose the developments in steel making and shipbuilding had come first and metal ships had existed before electricity. There would have been no demand. Electricity was very expensive. There would have been no demand for lights on those ships because with steel ships, fire was not a problem. There was a different way to solve it. The, sec the, the next place where we first started using lights was on street lights. Uh, because the thing we'd used to light the world was whale oil, and we were running out of whale oil. They started making coal gas, but of course that's synthetic fuel, and we haven't even solved that problem today. It was very, very expensive. Uh, and so we started street lights because the cost of coal gas and whale oil was so incredible. But just a, year, a few years after we started electrical lighting of streets, the East Texas oil fields were found in Spindletop, and all of a sudden, we could, have heat, we could have lit the world very cheaply based on petroleum. And so if spindle top had been discovered 15 years earlier, it's highly likely that the electrical lighting of streets would have been very much delayed because electricity wouldn't have been competitive with the very cheap oil coming out of Texas. Now, so here you have two events, steel ships and finding oil wells that have nothing to do with electricity, but in fact are central in terms of how rapidly we use electricity in the 19th century world. And see, I think it's those exactly the same kind of problems today if you think about various technologies, because the question is what's going to go along with those technologies that will make them pay off or not pay off? And think about the computer revolution. Almost everything people predicted about computers is wrong. The first thing they predicted about the telecommunication computer revolution is they're going to allow a spreading out of economic activity. We're all going to work at home, remember that? Uh, cities were going to decentralize. Tremendous force for decentralization. In fact, it has been a tremendous force for centralization. Since the telecommunication computer revolution, it looks like one city is going to gobble up every country in the world. If a city is both the financial capital and the political capital, it's almost Avogadro's number today. At least a third and maybe as much as 50% of all the people in that entire country will live in that one city. Tokyo, <coughs> London, Buenos Aires, Santiago, uh, you name it. Uh, and this decentralization that the telecommunication computer revolution was supposed to bring about, in fact, became a centralization because it allowed you to put all the financial activity of the world in three cities. Uh, and it didn't lead to the decentralization that people predicted. And so I think you know, that, that's one of the reasons why you can't deal with this subject in kind of a narrow economic cost-benefit way. Because if you do the economic cost-benefit calculations, you'll get them wrong uh, because all of these other things that seem completely tangential or unrelated, in fact, are central to making them pay off. Other things being equal is fine, but you can't have other things That's equal. Right. Yes. Merton? Our discussion this morning is, is focused on what we call the whole world, but in fact, it's really the free world. Um, what changes, if any, do you see between now and the year 2000 in terms of the exchange of science and technology and also goods and capital um, with the communist world? Newspapers are as good a source as I am. I find the, the changes going on in the entire part of the world extraordinarily rapid and uh, uh, unifying in some sense. I mean, in a weak sense at least, both in China and in, and in the Soviet Union. And to a degree in Eastern Europe, all the people I talk to just come back with there say that they're all saying it's going to be different now. Reconstruction and openness are going to spread. To a degree. See, let me make an argument that it's not a different world at all on, on two dimensions. It's the same world. Uh, in December a year ago, I was invited to spend a month in the Soviet Union as the guest of a guy by the name of Yakolov, whom I had met when he was head of the Institute for World Economics, but he's now secretary of the Central Committee in, 
a member of the Politburo. Uh, and uh, in the month that I was there, I guess I came to the conclusion that uh, Mr. Gorbachev has the General Motors problem. Uh, first of all, things are different. I spent a few days teaching at the University of Moscow, and the students would talk about draft dodging in Afghanistan. Now, I've, talk, I've taught at the University of Moscow before, but I can guarantee you, when I was there previously, nobody would ever have talked to a Westerner about anything personal, much less draft dodging. <laughs> uh, but it sounded like kind of the United States in 1968, but because everybody had these schemes to keep out of, out, out of Afghanistan, much like every American in 1968 had a scheme to keep out of Vietnam. But the reason I say it's the General Motors problem is it's the middle management problem. Gorbachev wants to change. Top management at General Motors wants to change. The question when you want to change is not how do you get the workers to change. They're willing to do anything. The question is how do you get the middle managers to be willing to change, and the middle managers don't want to change for a very good reason. They may think the new ball game that Gorbachev wants to play is a better ball game, or they may think the new ball game that Roger Smith wants to play is a better ball game, but they're winning the current ball game. And therefore, any new ball game is a risk to their position. And they don't want to take that risk. And so even if the old ball game is worse, they still want to play it. And we had a, a circumstance when I got there, they said to me, do you want to see some of our factories? And I said, well, the honest answer is no. <laughs> I've, seen a lot, I've seen a lot of obsolete consumer good factories in the Soviet Union. If you want to drag me through another lousy factory, I don't want to go. And that kind of took them back on their heels, and so they said, well, we're going, to we're going to take you to the leading machine tool factory in the Soviet Union. This is a factory that no American has been in or any other Westerner since 1945, and presumably it makes military equipment as well as civilian equipment. This factory is in Leningrad. I'm in Moscow. They get a guy who is the associate director of the Institute for the Study of the USA to take me to Leningrad. That's like being an assistant director of the CIA. Uh, he and I, and he has a whole briefcase of what I assume is permissions. I know that the number three man has said I can go because that's Yakolov, and maybe Gorbachev himself had to give permission. We, we end up at the factory gate, the Kirov works in Leningrad, and the attitude of this plant manager was, I don't know who the hell's going to be running this operation in the future, but be damned if I'm going to let this happen because somebody in the future may accuse me of letting a spy in this operation. And he can't say no because the boss has said yes, but he can say not today. So today is not convenient. Tomorrow I've got to check with Moscow. And he can outweigh me, because he knows I can't sit there for four months. Four days later, I'm not in that plant. And see, in the papers, they say something that is true. They say it's the bureaucrats in Moscow stopping it. That's not who's stopping it. It's the plant managers. Bureaucrats in Moscow are irrelevant. The plant managers are not irrelevant. And see, that's exactly the problem you have in your corporations. You want to do perestroika, restructuring. <laughs> who's going to stop you from doing perestroika? Your middle-level managers. They're the guys who are going to stop you from doing perestroika. And see, in that sense, Gorbachev has got your management problem. The only difference is that he's got 270 million employees. And I know none of you have 270 million employees. 